We like it when we get excited. This, yeah. is, this, is, this is a good thing. This is a good thing. Speaking of which, uh, before the uh, program began today, I introduced two old friends, uh, Debbie Meyer and Bob Kuttner. And Debbie looked at Bob and said, you know, I read you every day. And I could see Bob was thinking about, does he really write every day or does he take off a day a week, maybe two, uh, given his contributions to the prospect, to Huff, Huffington Post, uh, pretty much everywhere, not to mention uh, being the chief cook and bottle washer at, at, uh, at the American Prospect, authoring any number of books, most recently Debtor's Prison, and before that The Squandering of America, going all the way back, as I mentioned at the start, to his uh, 1970s book about the, uh, the overture of the right-wing ascendants, uh, Prop 13 in California, Revolt of the Haves. Bob Kuttner has been uh, one of America's, if not America's leading, uh, social democratic uh, voice, theorist, uh, Young people at the American Prospect often ask me, does Bob ever rest? Does he ever stop? I, I, I have occasionally answered that Bob is a manic depressive who's never depressive. Uh, it's not entirely accurate uh, description, but some days at the Prospect, it's some, it seems like it is. And may his mania for uh, uh, justice and equality only continue. Bob Kuttner. I'll try to live up to that. Uh, thank you, Harold. Uh, and thanks to Leo for titling this uh, in defense of the public square, because the, the public square is a much broader concept than the public sector. Uh, the public square is the space, the political and civic space, in which uh, a strong trade union movement, a strong public sector has to uh, live. And before I get to my remarks, I made a terrible lapse. Uh, Leo was kind enough to give me a few moments of introduction wearing my American Prospect hat, and I forgot to tell all of you that we are celebrating our 25th anniversary this month. Uh, you have in your packets the 25th anniversary issue, and on May 13th, we are having a 25th anniversary gala with a keynote uh, by Elizabeth Warren, so if you haven't signed up for that, I hope you will. Um, Jeff and uh, Mary Kay uh, did a terrific job explaining uh, why we need a strong public sector and a strong trade union movement. I want to broaden that and talk about why we need a strong public square in the sense of a space not just for government but for democratic deliberation and, uh, and citizenship. Now, according to the right wing, uh, we are simply consumers and producers, and to the extent that we have a life beyond the marketplace, in the libertarian story, we are to find that space in our families, in our church, uh, perhaps through charities. But uh, private life, whether as market actors or as people of faith and family, puts the human situation much too narrowly, because we are also citizens. And it is as citizens that we make democratic decisions about the collectivity. It's as citizens that we temper the harsh verdicts of the market. Now, it's not difficult, and Jeff uh, gave us the prologue, it's not difficult to demonstrate that uh, the market makes all kinds of uh, systematic mistakes, uh, produces outcomes that are neither equitable nor efficient, uh, Nicholas Stern, Lord Stern, refers to global climate change as history's uh, worst case of market failure. Uh, you might say that the financial collapse of 2007-2008 was history's second worst case. Um, the people who brought us that collapse pay themselves uh, billions of dollars a year, and yet their contribution to GDP is negative. That's not exactly the invisible hand being efficient. It's the invisible hand uh, on the visible throat of the economy. Uh, the collapse cost the economy uh, tens of trillions of dollars, much of which suffered by ordinary people, and that was the fruit of uh, deregulation. And you can tell story after story after story, and Jeff told you some of them, of public institutions that are simply more efficient as well as more equitable 
than private institutions. Uh, the health system anywhere else in the world produces more outcome for less money and more equitably shared outcome um, than ours. Uh, Medicare, our one island of single payer health insurance, is uh, more efficient than any of its private sector counterparts. Fannie Mae, back when it was a public institution, uh, before 1969, never lost money. It was scandal free. It was only when it got privatized and the wise guys got hold of it that uh, it generated uh, calamities. You can point to privatized highways that are both more expensive and more corrupt than their public center, uh, sector counterpart and privatized prisons that are uh, mainly achieving savings that uh, go to pay bribes um, by cutting the services for prisons and cutting the pay of people who work in the prisons. Um, and on and on and on. So um, not to mention, of course, uh, all of the uh, research and development gains that were the fruit of the, of the public sector. Our friend Dean Baker has calculated that if you took all of the money spent through NIH and NSF and through the premiums paid by Medicare and Medicaid and the veteran system, and uh, you simply put all pharmaceuticals into the public domain and did not patent them, you would get more, in, you'd get more R and D breakthroughs uh, at less cost to either consumers or taxpayers than under the present system, where pharma is consistently the first or second most profitable uh, industry uh, on Wall Street. So it's not it's not difficult uh, to demonstrate that often uh, the public sector is more efficient as well as more equitable than the private sector. Uh, it's also the case, quite apart from government's role in technological breakthroughs and in, in services, that um, let's remember government's role in promoting affirmative liberties. The libertarian story is that liberty is negative. Liberty is the absence of coercion. But uh, a young person from a poor family who doesn't have to incur crippling debt to go to college uh, is a freer person. Uh, a low-income mother who can afford to pay the doctor uh, because she and her children are covered by Medicaid or by S-CHIP uh, becomes a freer person. A worker not compelled to choose between her job and her physical safety is a freer person. The employee of a big box store uh, who can take pay paid family leave so as not to choose between her child and her job uh, is a freer person. An elderly person saved from uh, destitution by Social Security uh, is a freer person, and so is an aspiring homeowner who doesn't have to spend countless hours making sure that the mortgage uh, is not about to explode, uh, is, has more freedom to spend time on uh, leisure activities. I could go on and on and on and on. Uh, the point is there will, be never, there will never be enough charity, there will never be enough uh, market correction, there will never be enough benign paternalism to cover the ground that is only covered by these uh, social and public uh, counterweights. So it's easy to win the argument intellectually. What keeps me up at night is the question of why are we losing the argument politically? It's easy to argue them down based on the evidence, but uh, the other side seems to be winning the politics. I've thought about this a lot. Now, it seems to me there are a number of reasons for this. Um, one is that the media um, plays into a narrative about right-wing obstructionism uh, that uses cliches like politics is broken or government is broken or partisan bickering that uh, lets the right off the hook far too easily for systematic obstructionism. And so the obstructionism is rewarded. Uh, government is paralyzed, and uh, people who need government the most start uh, losing faith uh, in government. But it's even worse than that because uh, what has happened really since Carter, uh, more emphatically since Clinton, and unfortunately since Obama, which is even less excusable because we had one of those Roosevelt moments in, um, in 2008, 
that was not really seized. What, what has happened is that the distinction between the two parties has blurred because too many Democrats uh, spend too much of the time talking like Republicans like. And so the proposition that uh, we have a progressive party in this country whose job is to protect citizens from the predations of elites, from the predations of markets, um, that proposition ha has gotten very, very blurry. And um, when I was uh, young, uh, my Marxian friends used to toss around phrases that I thought were more than a little bit exaggerated. Phrases like the reserve army of the unemployed, phrases like the state is the executive committee of the ruling class. And you know, this was during the heyday of Galbraith's uh, countervailing institutions. It was during a period when the state uh, guaranteed the right of workers to join or organize unions and bargain collectively. Uh, it was a period when wages were rising with productivity and um, we did not have trade policies that allowed countries that systematically exploited their own workers to compete with American workers and we had something uh, close to full employment. Now, granted, uh, this was a social contract for prime age white men. Uh, but to the extent that uh, prime age white men were what was then referred to as heads of households, by extension, it was a social contract that, that also served families, even though the gender roles were, were reprehensible and African Americans were excluded, and then in the 60s we went about the business of expanding the social contract so that it extended to, to women to a greater degree and to African Americans. Um, well, you fast forward 50 years and what has happened. Uh, first of all, we do have a worldwide army of the uh, reserve army of hundreds of millions of desperately poor unemployed people who are dragging down wages all over the world. And we have the Reserve Army of the Unemployed made flesh here at home in institutions like TaskRabbit. Uh, TaskRabbit, if you haven't heard of it, is a computer service that, and of course it's a for-profit company, that um, matches uh, clients who are looking for someone to do odd jobs with people who need uh, the income. And the really insidious part that, that, that makes it kind of sound like a free market economist fantasy uh, merged with Marx is that um, the aspiring task rabbits bid against each other to see who will perform the job for the lowest wage. It's the, it's the street corner shape up, uh, everybody a casual worker uh, fantasy uh, that uh, bosses have always had, but it's the internet version. Um, and then, you know, is the state the executive committee of whom? Well, in the all too brief era between, uh, let's say, Roosevelt and LBJ, um, you could make a fair argument that the state was the executive committee of the working class. Uh, the state actually served the, the interests of, of regular people. Uh, it expanded social insurance, it promoted full employment, it regulated finance so that finance served the real economy rather than feathering its own nest, and uh, it promoted trade unionism, not just through the Wagner Act, uh, but even more importantly during World War II, where if you had a war production contract and uh, your employees wanted to unionize, uh, you could get hauled away in handcuffs if you tried to interfere with that right. So government was very much on the side of the public sphere for 30 or 40 years. Now at the time, that seemed normal. It seemed like this is what progress had brought us. As uh, Thomas Piketty has pointed out, maybe that era was anomalous. Maybe that era was the result of the stars being in alignment um, after World War II because uh, capital, uh, another Marxian idea to use the word capital as a collective noun that sounded quaint when I first heard it that now doesn't sound so quaint. But um, finance had been disgraced conveniently by the crash of 1929. Finance or capital had been well regulated. Um, in Europe, uh, the far right had gotten into bed often with 
a big business, and so big business didn't have as much power as it ordinarily did, and this libertarian society found itself in a mood that was very supportive of government, uh, first of all because the New Deal had brought us partway out of the Great Depression, secondly because World War II, a great planning exercise, had brought us the rest of the way out of the Great Depression, and then government doubled down after World War II with things like the GI Bill and FHA loans. And so this libertarian country experienced government as an affirmative force, and uh, finance was kept in its place. Well, when I was in college and in graduate school, that seemed normal. Little, little did I know uh, what kind of a reversal we were, we were in for. Now, the insidious thing about what has been going on lately, where not only are Republicans rewarded for obstructionism because regular people start giving up on the promise of affirmative government, uh, but because Democrats half the time are also in bed with Wall Street, uh, the idea that the state could be your friend as a countervailing institution has less credibility than it once did. And yet, if you look at the fight for 15 in a union movement, if you look at Senator Warren, uh, you see that there is a majority politics, a majoritarian politics around a progressive vision of what this country needs to be that's just waiting to be born. And as always, it requires the right combination of leadership and mass movement. If you look back on the past 50 years and you ask the question, uh, where have we made gains and where have we suffered losses? It's really quite interesting. Where we have made gains that were unimaginable uh, 50 years ago is on all of the inclusion issues and all of the tolerance issues. Uh, who would have imagined that um, same-sex marriage, contrary to the, uh, the DLC's version in the Clinton era, would be a wedge issue against Republicans rather than a wedge issue based on identity politics uh, against uh, Democrats. Uh, who would have imagined the gains uh, we would have made in, in, the, in the rights of women and in the rights of people with disabilities and um, in the fact that uh, young people, when polled, uh, the younger they are, the more tolerance they show for people who are different. So great gains in the fight for acceptance, the right for inclusion, which after all is the ultimate goal of the public square. A sense of affinity, a sense of solidarity, a sense of compassion for people who are not the same as we are. But on the issues of economic justice, who would have imagined that we would have gone backwards as, as fast and as far as we have done? And it seems to me that uh, there's a common explanation here. Uh, we win when we have strong movements. And every one of these battles for inclusion and acceptance was the fruit of struggle. It was the fruit of the gay rights movement or the civil rights movement or the women's movement or the, uh, the disability rights movement. And the, the mother of all movements, if you will, is the labor movement. But the bashing of the labor movement has been more fierce than even the bashing of all of those other movements, which is really quite remarkable when you think of the degree of homophobia that has existed in this country, when you think of how convenient it was for white males that there were many occupations that African Americans and women simply could not enter, uh, to realize that the power of capital, if you will, the power of Wall Street to assault working people is even more fierce than the reaction against all of those movements for rights. So what's the conclusion? Uh, the conclusion is that the only way to take back the public square is to take back the public square. Uh, we need uh, movements and we need leaders. Uh, you look at every successful social movement in American history, it is an alliance between uh, leaders and movements. Sometimes movements pushing leaders, sometimes leaders uh, affirming and validating movements. Uh, that's how it works. And there is so much 
frustration, so much privation around the fact that uh, hardworking people can't make ends meet, that all of the circumstances are ripe, not just for uh, rekindling the movement for economic justice, but for uh, rekindling the movement for a stronger democracy and a stronger public square. Uh, you know, the idea that money is speech and the idea that uh, corporations uh, are people, um, <laughs> it, it boggles the mind. And yet, this is now both uh, the conventional wisdom and the law of the land as defined by the Supreme Court. So uh, the moment is certainly ripe uh, to take back the public square. And um, it's not surprising that our friends in the labor movement, as so often has been the case, are uh, leading that struggle. And uh, as always, it's a pleasure and an honor to be uh, with you. Thank you.